the La Crosse Public Library Archives presents Dark La Crosse Stories, a series in collaboration with the La Crosse Tribune. Dark La Crosse is a suite of programs that feature the seedier side of La Crosse history and also include a downtown walking tour, a trolley tour, and an annual stage production with new content each year. One twenty two Fifth Avenue South, just across the street from the Hollywood Theater, was the site of Fifth Avenue Buffet and the favorite hangout of Private First Class Joe Goings of Company F, 9th Infantry, 2nd Division. He was from Benton, Arkansas, and might have made a great soldier, if not for his incredibly short fuse. On May 9, 1943, Goings got into an argument here with Private James Woodward of Ruby, South Carolina. Both men were being trained for combat at Fort McCoy. As the altercation escalated, Goings pulled out his Dallas Special, a small non-regulation knife that could easily be concealed up one sleeve, and stabbed Woodward with it. As Woodward lay in a pool of blood, Goings retreated out the door. After flagging down a woman near 4th and J, Goings asked to be driven anywhere. The woman must have noticed the blood on his trousers because she drove him directly to St. Francis Hospital, now Mayo Health System. He arrived at the very same time as his victim. Goings panicked, ditched his knife, and ran past the St. Rose Convent. He knocked on the door of the first residence he came to, asked to use the phone, and called a cab. Well, it was a slow night. Sunday night, I was parked in front of the firehouse listening to Jack Benny program on the radio when I got the call. I pulled up to Father Check's house. He was the pastor at St. Wenceslas Catholic Church, and I was expecting to pick up someone, I don't know, holy, I, I suppose. I was surprised when this GI hopped in the back. I couldn't figure out what this guy was doing at the Padre's house at this hour unless it was to receive his last rites. He was white as a sheet, sweating like crazy, and sort of hunched over. He told me, oh, just start driving. Well, we were almost on Alaska when he said, stop right here. This will do right fine. Drop me off right here. Well, he got out. He reached for his billfold, and that's when I saw the blood. This guy had blood all over his trousers. Well, this didn't sit right with me, you know, him acting all weird and such. Covered in blood, I said to myself, John, you, you got to call the police on this. So uh, that's just what I did. Sergeant Leo Kim got the call. He gathered Cy Delaney, the part owner of the Fifth Avenue Buffet, in order to identify the assailant. Delaney knew Joe Goings well. Just eight days earlier, Delaney had to subdue Goings, who was involved in a fight with another soldier. When the men arrived at the Willow Inn, Goings calmly said, You've got me. I'm the one you're after. Goings was put in jail, and Army officials picked him up the very next day. No one knows what happened to him next, but certainly a dishonorable discharge and likely some hard time in Leavenworth. Goings' horrific temper might have prolonged his life. The rest of his infantry would see the Battle of the Bulge. America would suffer over 80,000 casualties, 19,000 dead, 47,000 soldiers wounded, and 23,000 missing. It was the bloodiest American battle of World War II. And now I'd like to welcome in Bill Peterson, former archives librarian who recently retired after 34 years of service, who did some of the initial research for this story. This is one of the first dark lacrosse stories. The original concept of dark lacrosse was to present true stories on a walking tour that could be connected to a specific place, usually a building, in the central part of downtown La Crosse. While the Dark La Crosse suite of programs has moved beyond downtown now, we were still limited to the downtown core in that first year. Now for this story, I must tip my retired archives librarian hat to Mr. Doug Connell, a local historian who has done invaluable work on the history of La Crosse as a dedicated hobby. He created a series called La Crosse Time Trips that includes excerpts from lacrosse newspapers of interesting stories from several decades. It is here where I found the first mention of the 1943 murder of a soldier by another soldier in downtown lacrosse. Doug's brief description of the event in Time Trips piqued my interest and the actual newspaper articles themselves proved to be even more interesting. During World War II, huge numbers of soldiers trained at Camp McCoy, which is now known as Fort McCoy, between Sparta and Toma. La Crosse was the biggest town around, so when these soldiers had some R&R, &R, La Crosse, 
especially downtown La Crosse, was a logical destination. The city's bars and entertainment centers must have been filled with soldiers on certain nights of the week during the war. I'm sure the local police, as well as the military police, were kept busy trying to keep the peace among these large numbers of young men who were training for war and were coming to La Crosse to release, release the tension created by such training. I think it's a testament to the skill of the local authorities that there weren't more acts of violence that resulted in deaths like this one during the war years in La Crosse. I think the owners and employees of these establishments where the soldiers frequented also deserved a lot of the credit for keeping the peace. We saw in this story how the owner of the Fifth Avenue Buffet had stepped in to prevent private goings from a violent encounter the week before the murder of Private Woodward. I wonder how many times during the war these little interventions were repeated in downtown La Crosse and how many lives they saved. One of the interesting things of this story that I wish I could have found more information on was the weapon used in the murder a knife called the Dallas Special. The newspaper accounts made it sound as though this illegal, non-regulation knife was common at Camp McCoy. The fact that it had earned a nickname certainly would make it seem like it was not unusual for a soldier to have one at McCoy. Was camp life so rough that a soldier felt it was necessary to carry his own personal weapon for protection? Now, After Goins was arrested by local authorities, he only spent about a day in the local jail before the military authorities came and took him back to Camp McCoy. It's here where the local sources dry up and we could not find the fate of Joseph Goines. A general court martial was in the works and a lengthy prison sentence was likely, but no local records of this were found. Perhaps the local newspapers from Goines' hometown of Benton, Arkansas may have had something, but these were not readily available. Finally, after this research was over, I was left wondering how the families involved in this tragedy coped with the events. At the time of the incident, no matter where you lived in America, whether it was your own family or a neighbor's, chances are someone was dealing with the loss of a son or a brother in the war. Most of these deaths were combat related, some happened during training, and all were recognized with sympathy and honor by your fellow Americans. But to have a son murdered by a fellow soldier in a senseless brawl in some eating joint in Wisconsin, or to have your son serving time in Leavenworth for years because he killed another fellow soldier in a fight totally unrelated to the service of your country, these circumstances must have been extremely difficult to, do, to deal with. A tragedy indeed. Thank you for listening.